Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Elseworlds Exchange. I am Sal. And I'm Tiffany. And today we're talking with a very special guest. Uh, Joel will be available next week on another topic, but today, since we're going to be talking about Disney's Gargoyles, which is a show, it's a comic, it's it's so many things to so many different people, we thought we'd take an opportunity to chat with uh, Greg Weissman, uh, co-creator of the show, and uh, he's got a number of projects we want to talk about and get into but uh, I've spoken enough, and Tiffany hasn't said anything, and neither has Greg, so I'm going to let them, you know, jump into it and, intro and introduce uh, Greg. Welcome to the show. Thanks. Glad to be here. <laughs> um, yeah, so, Tiffany, uh, you and I both watched uh, the show, but before we get into it, uh, let's talk a little bit about what Greg is working on now yeah. and where you can go to get it. Yep. Oh, I thought you were going to do that. Sorry. Nope. <laughs> Um, so right now, Greg, I know you're, um, you're looking to hopefully talk about, uh, your novels, um, Reign of Ghosts, a uh, Reign of the Ghosts, and the sequel, uh, Spirits of Ash and Foam. Right, so I've written these two books, um, I started this Reign of the Ghosts, uh, initially right after, uh, working on Gargoyles, so it's got that same feel, that same sort of mix of the modern with with mythology. In this case, it's mostly the mythology of the uh, Taino people who were the indigenous inhabitants of the Caribbean before Columbus arrived. And that, that's a great pantheon of gods and a great mythology that, from a pop culture standpoint, frankly, no one's ever heard of. No, there's no representation uh, there. <laughs> and so uh, I was able to sort of, almost like version territory, able to sort of... Um, make use of these myths and there's Shakespeare in it because of course I'm a Shakespeare fanatic myself and um, and all sorts of the stuff. So if you like gargoyles, which I know is mostly what we'll be talking about today, <laughs> I, I do think you'll like uh, Rain and Spirits. They're the first two books in what I hope will be a nine book series. Oh, nice. I'm currently doing research for the third novel, which will be called Mask of Bones. Um, and, uh, and also, for Reign of the Ghosts, we are in the process of completing a unabridged, full-cast uh, audio play version of the novel, which will be available by the end of the year on audible.com. Oh, awesome. that sounds and, amazing. Yeah, it's got 20 actors playing 30 roles. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, cast Sweet. includes Edward Asner, Rina Sirtis, Brent Spiner, um, uh, Steve Bloom, Vanessa Marshall, wow. Josh Keaton. Jeff Bennett, Tom Adcox, really an amazing cast. Yeah. We've got, it's about four hours long, and I think we have something like three hours and 52 minutes of original music composed by uh, Lolita Rittmanis, Michael McQuistian, and Chris Carter, where the composers on shows like uh, Batman, the Bird, and the Bull, Special after Spider-Man, Young Justice, Avengers Earth's Mightiest Heroes, mm -hmm. and many, many others. Um, and it's really like a four-hour animated movie, except all the animation is in your head. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I know you can't see my face, but I'm just grinning like an idiot because it seriously sounds amazing, and I cannot wait to check it out. <laughs> it's really cool. You can uh, read about it and see video. We did uh, making of videos at reignoftheghosts.com. That was originally our Kickstarter site, but we're fully funded, so you can safely go to that site and not fear that someone's going to ask you for money. <laughs> um, in fact, some of the videos do ask for money, but the money's all, we got it. Well, there you go. We right. don't need it anymore, and, and you can just enjoy the videos and not worry about that. Uh, uh, but there's some great making of videos there, and in fact, the production is 100% completed. Uh, what we're doing now is fulfilling the Kickstarter rewards oh, cool. for our very generous donors. And then as soon as that's done, since we promised those donors that they would get theirs first, um, then we'll put it up on audible.com. And so our goal is to do that, uh, get all that done by the end of this year. Awesome. That would honestly, if, to have it done by the end of the year, I could see that easily being an amazing holiday gift oh, for easily. like anyone who's a fan of any of your previous work. So... Yeah. That's a great time frame. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. So, yeah, uh, from there, I guess we'll jump into it. Um, yeah, I, but let's make sure at the end of the show, yes. if anyone, you know, didn't get any of that information, we'll make sure we go over it one more time at the end. And there's also down in the description box down below, you can find that site that Greg mentioned. That's right. Um, yeah, and I'm doing a few other things, too. I'm uh, uh, 
since I'm in a pimp mode right now, I'm going to pimp <laughs> a lot of things. Um, I've got a couple Marvel comic books, um, Star Wars Kanan, The Last Padawan. The trade of the first six issues is just came out this past week, um, and I'm currently writing issue 12 now. Uh, issue 7 is out. Issue 8 will be out later this month. Great. And I'm writing through 12. And then I'm also writing a book called Star Brand and Night Mask for yes. Marvel, which is in their superhero universe. And um, That's I'm really currently exciting. writing issue three. But I uh, just today got the proofs for issue one to review. And, and that's coming out next month. Issue mm-hmm. one for Star Brand and Night Mask launches next month. That is very and then I'm also exciting. Working Sorry. <laughs> it's fun. They're both, they're both really fun. Yeah. Um, and then I'm also working on a preschool show called Shimmer and Shine for Nickelodeon. That's really oh, fun. Wow. So any of our uh, parent audience might be able to look forward to getting oh, some. Oh, absolutely. No, absolutely. Because <laughs> we do have an audience of, 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 of yes. moms and dads, which I'm surprised by. <laughs> <laughs> um, but even still, like it's, like you're really reaching out to all age groups. That's right which is like really remarkable because a lot of people who are creators sometimes target a specific audience, but Mm -hmm. it's really great to see somebody extending their reach to so many different ages. Yeah, it's true. Yes. You know, hail Hydra. (laughs) (laughs) Did I say that out loud? Um, You know, absolutely. You can say that. (laughs) Yeah, 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 totally. (laughs) Um, so again, you know, if anyone missed anything, yep. you know, we'll... go to the description box down below, or we will at the end of the program, or towards the end of the program, we will reiterate some of these uh, exciting and incredible projects. Yeah, I'm really looking forward to. <laughs> um, so if it's okay with you, Greg, I'd love to talk about the early to mid '90s, and in particular, a pretty spectacular show. Uh, that came out around 1994 um, and was a kind of a world-changing show for me mm-hmm. by the name of Gargoyles. <laughs> um, I mean, 1994, uh, Disney also put out Aladdin, which was, you know, exciting and a kind of in a new direction for them. Previously, mm-hmm. they have been putting out things like Tailspin and Darkwing Duck and Rescue Rangers. And then we saw Aladdin and then this show shows up on the scene yeah and it's like nothing i've ever seen before um from the get-go from the first episode where there's no catchy opening theme song there's you know there's no previously established characters or fan base exactly um the world is dark and more realistic and it's you know not talking down to us um i would love to know how the show came about. What was the pitch sessions like? Like, how did this all coalesce? Because it seems very outside of the Disney wheelhouse this to me. This is true. Uh, and that was part of the advantage of it. Um, what it really, though, began as was something very much in the Disney wheelhouse. Um, it was still an original property, but um, we really started with a another Disney afternoon TV show called Gummy Bears. Really? Um, or rather, the full title was Disney's Adventures of the Gummy Bears. That's right. It was this very was long. So that um, was created by an incredible guy named Jim Magon, um, who uh, created this amazing backstory and mythology mm-hmm. for... Uh, gummy bears set in this medieval world and we just thought those of us in development um because i was director of series development at at the time at walt disney television animation those of us in development just thought gummy bears was this wonderful show that wasn't getting enough respect Mm -hmm. and there was a a big reason for that which is that there was brand confusion Mm -hmm. there was another show out around the same time called care bears (laughs) care bears and gummy bears were both shows about um, cute little multicolored bears. Right. Yep. But whereas Gummy Bears was this, you know, adventure show, it had comedy certainly, but it was this adventure show with great mm-hmm. characters, um, this wonderful backstory, this great mythology, um, funny villains who <laughs> yes. were still dangerous, you know, all that stuff. 
Care Bears was this saccharine sweet show about <laughs> you need a hug. You know, in other words, it, it, yes. it, 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 you know, it's the kind of show that gives you diabetes, and yet ours was the show that was named after a candy. Right. 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 So I think the brand confusion was legit. Mm-hmm. It wasn't people being, you know, a lot of times there's brand confusion. You just go, oh, that's just lazy thinking. Right, right. You know? But here, I think there were real legit reasons for that brand confusion. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But we just thought, we want to do a show like that, that has that kind of backstory and mythology and great characters. And still funny, you know, comedy, adventure, lots of action, but lots of humor. Um but we just wanted it to get more respect. So we right. did two things right off the bat. The first, and obviously the most important, is instead of doing it about little multicolored bears, <laughs> we did it about little multicolored gargoyles. Right. So we oh, had yeah. this cast of five or six uh, little cute gargoyles. Um, and we thought, well, that's edgier, and that won't be confused <laughs> with, you know, care bears or ducks or poodles or whatever. Right. You know, it's something different. And the second thing was, is we thought, let's set it in the modern world. It will still have this medieval backstory Mm -hmm. um, with magic and all sorts of great things, but we'll set it in the present and have these gargoyles wake up after being asleep for a thousand years. That will give us fish out of water stories and all this stuff, stuff that kind of things that we did end up doing in the show. Mm -hmm. But this was very much a comedy adventure show. Mm -hmm. Again, cute little gargoyles, right. mischievous, getting into trouble. <laughs> there were villains very much in the vein um, of Duke Big Thorn or Captain Hook, that kind of okay. villain, you know. Um, and it was fun. And we pitched that show to Michael Eisner, who at the time was uh, chairman of the Walt Disney Company. Uh-huh. He was the guy who made the shows for the Disney afternoon. Right. And he passed. Didn't like it. Oh, but we thought, you know, even my boss and my immediate bosses, you know, were just like, there's something in this. And we thought, and it's like, go back to the drawing board. Try again. <laughs> you know, figure something out because there's something here. Right. So um, one of the things I did next is I showed it to a, a few people who had not been involved in putting the first pitch together so we could get fresh eyes on it. Okay. And one of the people we showed it to was a guy named Tad Stone, the creator of Duckling Duck, Chippendales Rescue Rangers. Again, another really smart guy in, who was at TV Animation at the time. Yeah. And Tad had this one brilliant sort of seminal suggestion. It's like, well, you've got all these cute little gargoyles. What if you had one big gargoyle? <laughs> you know, we had the human female friend uh-huh. already. He's like, what if you put one big gargoyle opposite this human female mm. you know do a sort of beauty and the beast thing because i don't know if you know this but disney had this little movie called beauty and the beast <laughs> right yeah kind of did well for them get a little bit of business for them you know right. yeah, um, yeah, and they're yeah, like nominated for best picture. And was like you know that's just something that eisner would get you know right. uh, yeah he could immediately so, see that that imagery and be like oh i recognize this and it feels familiar <laughs> and yet also profitable to me exactly so that really clicked, like, you know, turned on a light bulb for me. Mm-hmm. My background prior to coming to Disney had been in comic books, mm-hmm. specifically superhero comic books. Okay. And so uh, with the help of an uh, artist named Greg Guler, um, uh, we created uh, the character of Goliath, mm-hmm. who did not exist in the comedy development at all. Even, really? you know, there was a comedy version of Xanatos. There was a comedy version <laughs> of Demona. There was a comedy version of Brooklyn Lexington, Broadway, wow. Hudson. But there was no common version of Goliath. That's amazing. But we created the character of Goliath, and then we took everything else in the comedy show and put it through the prism of Goliath. Okay. And it came out the other end as the show that you guys more or less know. <laughs> right. This is this action drama. Mm-hmm. And, it, and we loved this show, so we came up with this huge pitch. It had the mutates in it, and it had you know, clones, and it had all this stuff, all stuff that we did eventually do in the show. Right. Mm-hmm. But this really long pitch with all these great ideas, in it, and we pitched it to Eisner about six months after the first pitch. Oh. And he passed. He didn't like it. Wow. 
And so the next day, we had a meeting with Jeffrey Katzenberg, who at the time was just under Michael Eisner, and he was the chairman of the Walt Disney Studio back then. Mm -hmm. And we were really having the meeting to talk about the shows that Michael had bought, which I think, I don't remember the exact order of things now. It's been so long. Yeah. Um, But I think it was either Goof Troop or Bonkers. I forget which one. Mm. Um, obviously both of those were shows we ended up doing, but I don't remember which <laughs> one we discussed at this specific meeting. <laughs> um, but then when we were done, we were all standing up to leave and Jeffrey says, Oh, and you're going to work on Gargoyle some more. Oh. And I was like, well, no, I mean, we pitched it as a comedy and he killed it and we pitched it as an action drama and killed it. I, I, I don't know what else to do. He doesn't yeah. like mm-hmm. it. He's like, oh no, he didn't kill it. He just thought it needed more work. <laughs> <laughs> and this- I turned to my immediate boss, Bruce Cranston, and Bruce and I have this, you know, share this look because, you know, I've been doing this at this point. I've been an executive at Disney for five years. I've yeah. been pitching shows for four and a half of those years. Um, and, you know, when a show gets killed, I know it. Nobody in that room was confused about what happened or where we were right. going with it. So, and I know that Jeffrey knows this too. So a couple things were going on there. One was that um, my and Bruce's boss, who's head of TV animation, uh, was a guy named Gary Kreisel. And Gary had been talking to Jeffrey about the fact that even though our shows on the Disney afternoon were very successful and very well done, mm-hmm. There was a certain uh, uh, commonality between them. Mm-hmm. Ducks, you know, funny talking animals. Ducks, yeah. <laughs> bears, you know, um, dogs, whatever. Mm-hmm. And his concern, Gary's concern, which he had expressed to Jeffrey, sort of behind the scenes, we weren't in that meeting, was that, you know, we needed to make expand on the Disney afternoon because at some point people will just start getting tired of the funny talking animals. So we need to have more in essence, you know, arrows in our quiver. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, so Jeffrey had that in mind, I think, but the other thing was what became clear to us in this meeting mm-hmm. with Jeffrey was that Michael hadn't liked the show. I was confident about that, mm-hmm. but um, Jeffrey had. And in those days, at least, Jeffrey wasn't about to sort of confront Michael and say, you know, <laughs> you know you're wrong or anything like that. But right. he was willing to sort of say, yeah, I keep working on this. Mm-hmm. So we went back to the drawing board for a third time. We looked at the show and said, okay, what do we want to change about this show? Yeah. And the answer we came up with was nothing. We don't <laughs> want to change anything at all about the show. We love the show. The show's right. Problem's not the show. The problem clearly is the pitch. Right. right. And what we realized is that we had thrown all these great ideas into the pitch and it was distracting. Mm. And we cut the pitch way down. We added nothing. We just trimmed it to the bone. Right. And we focused it. We reordered some stuff. We really focused it on the Goliath, Elisa, Beauty and the Beast story. Which is where you were starting from the first place, the idea of... Like... Where we were starting from the first place, and still what the show was fundamentally, you know, um, I don't want to say that's what it was about, but it's still a huge thematic element to the oh, show, yeah, probably. No. Yeah, a big and... undercurrent of the show was definitely the <clears throat> the tension and the, and, the, and the drama between those two characters. So, yeah. Exactly. So... But our pitch had gotten out of control. And one of the things I've learned in this business, and unfortunately because I'm slow of study, I have to learn over and over and over again, that feels is that when it comes to pitching, um, less is more. Mm. By adding all that stuff and we distracted from this great thematic thing that would have helped sell it. Right. So we cut the pitch way, way back. And we went about six months later and pitched it to Eisner one more time. <laughs> And this time he bought it. Yeah. And when the meeting was over, Jeffrey looked at me and said, you added a lot to that, didn't you? <laughs> and I said, yes, I did. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> My mother did not raise no fool. Right. So. 
Oh no! It went through heavy scrutiny, and we cre- we changed a lot. Yeah. <laughs> that is that is a spectacular tale. I mean, the fact is, I would have I watched the gummy bears, and I would have never thought that from that that yeah. this show would really have its roots. Um, but now there's, that you there's, say there's it, no doubt whatsoever <laughs> that the single greatest influence on the creation of Gargoyles, not necessarily on the production of it, but on the creation of Gargoyles. And there were a lot of influences. Hill Street Blues was a big influence. There were a lot of influences from all over the map. But the single largest influence on the creation of the show was Disney's Adventures of the Gummy Bears, created by Jim Mayo. You know, it's funny because you'd never think about it, but yeah, like once you start drawing the parallels of like the diff- the multicolored characters and all of them bring a different like personality to a to, to a group that represents each element of a person. Yeah, no, it. it Wow, that's kind of funny. I never yeah. would have thought that. And, and what a weirdly rich and explorative mythology and universe that Gummy Bears show actually kind of was. Yeah, it was interesting. It was always that always captivated me. <laughs> but I was yeah, but I yeah, that's funny. So we all right. We covered the pitch. That was that's something that I was I've always been kind of curious about. You were like absolutely. How do you sell this show? Yeah. Because in a world where you know, like you said, the Disney afternoon was just kind of, while it was interesting and, and, and evo- evocative of a lot of different things, you, you kind of, you have this element of everyone's a car- everyone's a cartoon animal, and they're all kind of teaching you a lesson about sharing and hygiene. Here's a show. Well, I mean, <laughs> it took us two years to sell the show. Also. Right. Yeah. <laughs> two yeah. years to sell the show. It was interesting because at one point, after the show was on the air, um, we were actually sued by a guy who claimed that we stole his idea. No kidding. We'd never seen his idea. Oh, of course. Ever. Right, right. <laughs> the, 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 the fun thing was is that he's going, um, yes, uh, well, I didn't personally show it to him, but I gave it to someone who, who must have shown it to him because look how similar they are. And we're like, well, when did this happen? He's like, I created this show. You know, the show premiered in 94. Mm-hmm. Like, I created this show in 1993. <laughs> we're like, Uh-oh. right, I, I created it in 1991, and we've got all this documentation. To right, prove it, right, you know right. What I mean? And it took us two years to sell the show. Yeah. And then a year to get it produced. So he was thinking that, oh, see, it came out in the fall of 94, but I created it in 93. Right. You know, exactly. you're like, yeah, you right. know. Yeah, people, Grow up. It, just goes to, it really just goes to show you to, or not just you two, but like to show everyone that like no one honestly knows how much effort, how much work goes into the production of these shows. I mean, for yeah. us, it's just, there it, it is. It's just an instant thing. Yeah. yeah, it's instantaneously there. There's maybe some time in between a season or so, whatever, mm-hmm. it's done. Like, oh, I went to a room, I, I gave someone my idea, and then we went for it. Yeah. Not, not this took a really long time to make happen. Well, and, and one of the things, when it, this would be for... From my um, vantage point, this would be an element, uh, this would be a, a, a kind of Weissman element where um, you would be fighting tooth and nail to get a really damn good show <laughs> into the yeah. into the homes of everybody who would appreciate it. Um, I, you know, I, I think that characterization isn't true, not on Gargoyles. <laughs> um, the tooth and nail idea, you know, that somehow I... I mean, I, I think it's fair to say I championed this show, but yeah. I also, and and God knows it took us a while to to get yeah. Eisner to sign off on it. Mm-hmm. But, I, but what I will say is once Eisner signed off on it, I mean, Eisner was sort of the last of the great movie moments. Right. And the thing about having Michael Eisner in your corner, once he was there, he was there. And what that also meant within the Walt Disney Company is that everyone in every division got on board or got out of the way. Gotcha, yeah. So once you had that powerhouse behind It was not a fight. Once we had that green light... It was full steam ahead. There was no fight. Right. You know, uh, not that we didn't do everything in our power to make as good a show as we could possibly make. Of course. We got tremendous cooperation all across the board within the Walt Disney Company, um, Mm. certainly within our own division, but in other divisions as well. Yeah. Um, no one, it wasn't, you know, I've been on shows that you just feel like you are the lone grinding one. yourself <laughs> to a nut trying to get a quality show on the air. And this was not one of those cases that we were a little bit blessed. Right. Um, part of the issue was there were other problems at Disney TV animation on other shows. Mm-hmm. Um, I moved over from being an executive to being a producer on the show. Hmm. Um, and but because I had been an executive, it, uh, the metaphor I usually use is, you know, like in insane asylums, 
they have trustees. Yeah. There's still patients, <laughs> you know, there, mm -hmm. but they give them batons to keep the other patients in line. And so that's sort of what I referred to myself, even at the time was, um, I was the lunatic most trusted. So, <laughs> um, so, you know, we were very much left alone to a huge degree, yeah. partially because there were other shows that were kind of in flux or in trouble and ours was not right. and partially because of what my role had been previous. Um, but we really had tremendous creative freedom hmm. on every level and tremendous support within the company, at least for those two years. Right. After that, the support very much vanished, but um, at least for a couple of years, it was there and, and it all I don't want to say it was easy because nothing. <laughs> but it definitely that, coalesced. But but it, it was not a fight. Gotcha. So, you know, talking about not only the the rich lore that which I I definitely want to get to mm -hmm. um, concerning this show, um, what struck me the most as a as a kid and even now as an adult was the fact that this show truly did not talk down to children. There are plenty of shows in the 90s today that truly, you know, feel like they have to, you know, make a story rock simple for a child to understand it. And you guys created a show that challenged me um, as a viewer to, you know, not only learn new things, mm -hmm. but also to deal with real life issues and like complex storylines um you dealt with controversial issues like gun use i mean that show that episode deadly force stuck with me forever because to me that was the moment where i was like this show is like nothing i've ever seen yeah now tiffany and i have a have a debate about this i assumed the deadly force the the gun episode was a suggestion from the studio and she thinks it was a suggestion from creative. Can you help us <laughs> answer that question? Uh, it came from us, but we felt like we had a fight with the studio over it. Really? I mean, uh, it, it, um, you know, it was our idea. It, and to be clear, particularly for members of your audience who may not have seen it yet, mm -hmm. this was an episode about gun safety. Right. Yes. It was yep. not an episode about gun control. It was no. not an episode about, about you know, rights. banning guns or anything like that. I'm not, yeah. I have strong opinions about that, but that's not what <laughs> this was about. Right. This was about gun safety. This was about a woman, Elisa Mazza, who was a, a New York City police detective who needed, I mean, who had uh, a who had a firearm. Mm -hmm. She should have had a firearm. No one questioned whether or not she should have a firearm. Right. The question was, be, was about when she got home from work at the end of the day, where did she put it? That's right. And um, since she lived alone with a cat, <laughs> until, you know, she just literally hung it up on a coat rack. You know, mm -hmm. I don't mean a gun, but her holster. She just hung her shoulder holster, holster up on a coat rack. And didn't think twice about it because she lived alone. But the problem was, is that she had people coming in and out of her apartment who didn't live there. Mm -hmm. Specifically, a character at Broadway who was one of the gargoyles who had very, very limited experience with guns. Mm -hmm. She never used one. Came from the 10th century, so that helps <laughs> right. explain it. <laughs> yeah. And... Uh, and what he knew about guns, he's learned from watching television and movies. Mm -hmm. And they just seemed like fun to him. Right. Yep. So he saw the gun there like a child, thought it looked cool, picked it up, and because he had big damn fingers, <laughs> accidentally, accidentally fired it. And, um, and accidentally shot Elisa. Mm -hmm. right. Now, like I said, I have strong opinions about gun control, but that's not what this episode right. was no. about. This no. episode was about gun safety, about how you keep guns when you have children in the house. Mm -hmm. um, and for, um, for you me uh, mentioned a... earlier, you know, I think before the interview started, you know, was this episode controversial? And the truth is it wasn't right. at all. Right. When it first came um, out, I assumed it was just, well, like many of us, it was just accepted yes. as just an episode. It was mm -hmm. just another, but, I, but I noticed a trend. Well, no, it, it actually got a lot of attention. Oh. But almost all of it, not almost all of it, at the time, <laughs> all of it, positive. Yes. Uh, in other words, this is something that 
parents should watch with their kids, you mm-hmm. know, kind of thing. Right. Um, later, Disney got nervous about the episode. I'm talking about years later. Yeah. Mm-hmm. They got nervous about the episode, and there was a period of time when they wouldn't air it anymore. Yeah. yeah. Um, and I tried to call them and said, guys, this is the episode we got all this praise for. We got yeah. praise in TV Guide. We got praise from experts, you know, mm-hmm. child psychology experts saying, this is a great episode for kids, you know, kind of thing. Mm-hmm. And um, and Disney was like, oh, I don't know, it's scary. We we can't air this one. Yeah. And then they got over it. You know, a different regime came in again, and and you know, the original regime was great with it, and the mm-hmm. regime came in for a while that was afraid of it, and then a new regime came in, and it's all fine. Yeah. You know, um, it has nothing to do with the episode. <laughs> it only has to do with who. Who was, was in the charge store. at the time? Oh, right. Yeah. That that episode for me, there was just there was so much to it. And again, for me, it's always like the place I point to anytime I'm trying to explain how spectacular their show is. If if I can't nail them, if a person with the lore and um, you know, just the all the, the mythology, the mythology, of the, show. the history, the the fantastic references, that episode, and the fact that you took this character and then not only forced them to you know, deal with consequences, but then having to deal with the truth of those consequences. Like yeah. that for me was absolutely spectacular because that level of character development wasn't something I really saw in children's programming at yeah. that time. It certainly is uh, absent from a lot of, from a lot of animation because of the, 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 the serial nature of it. The, the fact that you'd have kind of have to start back at square one with a lot of characters, uh, with a lot of like cartoon shows, where it's like, okay, make sure everything's back exactly where you left it the first time, because we don't want anyone to get confused. Or, oh. and, yeah, I mean, one of the things that we said at the very beginning of making Gargoyles is that this was not going to be status quo television. Right. Right? <laughs> Most, a lot of television, even today, um, although less today than when I was a kid, um, was what you'd call status quo antebellum television, which is by the end of the episode, the situation had to be back where it was by the beginning of the episode, so that these episodes could be aired in any order, and so that um, the situation didn't change in any significant way, so that the reason people liked the show was always the reason they liked the show. They didn't grow with the show. They didn't change with the show. The characters didn't change ever, really. Lessons were very temporary, and that was something that we decided categorically we were not going to do. Um, and so the idea of consequences became paramount mm-hmm. uh, to the ongoing development of episodes in that show. So, for example, in the episode following um, Deadly Force, the one we were just talking about, mm-hmm. in the next episode, Elisa is still not back on duty. She's on crutches. She's right. still late. Yes. You know, we and and yes. we made it clear weeks had passed. It wasn't like, oh yeah, the next day she was up on crutches. You know, now she'd been in the hospital for a while. Mm-hmm. Now she was up and about, but she was on crutches. And it wasn't until another episode down the road where she was finally back, starting back at work. Yeah. And even then, there were repercussions. Up to that point, Elisa had been working without a partner. Right. Yes. And <laughs> and when she came back, her captain was like no more now you're working with a partner and elisa's mm-hmm. like wait a minute that was a gun accident in my I, own home it had nothing to do with whether or not you need a partner and the captain was like i don't care yeah 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 um there were repercussions for that that were ongoing it wasn't something that we just sort of did and then it's like the next episode elisa's back and up and about and as if nothing ever happened right and there were repercussions for Broadway having fired that guy. It oh, changed exactly. his attitude towards yep. um, guns. And it changed his attitude towards going to movies. <laughs> um, yes. So, I mean, that was part of what we wanted for this show. Oh, well, no, absolutely. I mean, like, you, not only did you guys follow amazing continuity and allow your characters to grow, but I mean, like you mentioned with the crutches, like, what an amazing detail to keep. You know, we eventually have a character, Owen, who has his arm turned to stone, and you guys <laughs> held on to That's that. Right. You know, like <clears throat> that detail and that commitment to being like, this is the story, and if something happens, that's going to keep going on. Like, yeah. that's not going to just go away unless we find a way to make it go away. Exactly. Naturally. That, again, that's one of the hallmarks for this show for me. Like, 
making it like you know something that has aged incredibly gracefully in yeah. my opinion you know it's something that i enjoyed back in the 90s and can enjoy today um, I, I i will say i mean and this sounds very immodest but i believe it i think the show's held up remarkably well and the only moments when you're watching it when you can really sort of see uh or it feels a little dated is when they pull out Floppy disk. Yeah, when Dan was so cold out of the cell phone, the size of the cell Yeah, information or when they're when they dial a rotary phone or something like that, people are like, "What? Oh yeah." Yeah, yeah. But other than that, so, like, I think in the nineties we were using rotary phones. No, that's, <laughs> true. All right. that's fair. <laughs> but, um, but you know, you see Vanitas' cell phone at one point, and and you know, it's yeah, it's big, it's <laughs> about the size of his own head. You know, right. I mean, it, it's gigantic and. And they don't use cell phones on a regular basis the way Yeah, we no, only today. Xanatos could have a cell phone. <laughs> yeah, no one else could afford a cell phone back then, right. and, and his was massive. Um, so, you know, it. it, it I, I think those are the only moments, a few tech-oriented things, yeah. are the only moments where you look at it and go, huh, uh, yeah, this was from the 90s. But other, <laughs> otherwise, I think it holds up really I, well, and, and it's kind of timeless. Well, that's the that's the mark of good fiction is that is the timelessness of it is the fact that you can legitimately set it at any point. I mean, I think that also, of course, represents the Shakespearean influence of of, of gargoyles, but also you know the fact that you can legitimately set it anywhere and any time, and it kind of still translates. Um, uh, the fact that you know you have the fish out of water, like they you know they're in the tenth century, they come to the modern century. You need that element, but at the same time, like. Gargoyles could be today, in the '90s, the '80s. It doesn't really matter. You could really set it at any point, mm -hmm. and uh, <clears throat> and the themes and the the characters all still ring true. And that's, you know, it, it's just the rest of it's all window dressing. Um, you would you would an issue or a uh, well, I mean, you this show is again so rich in its lore and its history. Um, I definitely want to touch on the fact that you take this spectacular second season i love the first season i loved the second season mm -hmm. because of how much it opened up my world to the like even just the a slightest introduction to world myth and world lore and it really you know drove me to want to learn more you took these characters well you took at least elisa and and goliath <laughs> and um and bronx and um Angela and right. set them on this world tour where they went and experienced Scottish myth and Hebrew myth and Irish myth and African myth and Scandinavian. They went to Easter Island. Yep. They experienced Native American lore. They experienced an Australian walkabout. This like blew my mind and opened my like my eyes to it and it really like grew this fire in me that I, I couldn't wait to go to the library to like take out books on this because I needed to know more just from these little introductions. Was that something you guys had always intended on? Is it just something you were plain old interested in? <laughs> you know, it's just, it's so ingrained in the show. Yeah. Well, I think the answer is all of the above. I mean, <laughs> we had one sort of practical consideration, which was that um, season one had been 13 episodes mm -hmm. um, on a 10 month sliding schedule. Mm hmm. Season two was 52 episodes. <laughs> of it, you know, so, um, you know, in the same amount of time, we had to create um, a tremendous exponential growth in product. Um, and that meant, you know, we quadrupled the size of our crew and writing staff. Right. But it also meant that we had to expand this world. You couldn't come, I mean, you couldn't, generate 52 episodes that the world stayed as small as it had been in season one. Right. Now, that didn't necessarily mean we had to go on the world tour, but that was something that interested me. Diversity uh, has always been a priority for me, certainly um, from Gargoyles on, probably before that. Mm -hmm. But, you know, we had uh, Elisa mother was African-American, her, yes. her father was Native American. Mm -hmm. Those were things we wanted to explore and that we did get stories out of. And, you know, I wanted to, you know, the gargoyles had come from Scotland, but we wanted to explore other mythologies. Mm -hmm. So, um, it, you know, what we were talking about earlier about the Taino myths and Reign of the Ghosts, mm -hmm. 
you know, I didn't even know about the Taino back then, but we explored the myth of Raven and uh, mm-hmm. um, in Canadian Native American mythology, the myth yeah. of Coyote in Southwestern, yep. Anansi the Spider in African. We dealt with um, South American, yes. uh, the Coatl. Mm-hmm. Uh, we dealt with um, Norse mythology, yeah. Greek mythology. Um, Japanese Arthurian legend, um, and of course, a ton of Shakespeare all the time. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. That, um, that I cannot wait to touch on because. <laughs> <clears throat> um, but, you know, the basic thing is, is that, you know, I wanted to create a diverse world. We wanted it to be coherent, so we created this concept of we introduced Puck, and we used Puck to introduce the whole and the Weird Sisters and other Shakespearean characters just this idea of the children of Oberon. Mm-hmm. Right. We intentionally made Oberon and Titania blue-skinned and green-skinned because I didn't mm-hmm. want Caucasian, yeah. you know, the whole children of Oberon uh, concept was basically feudal in concept, that they that everyone had their little fifesons, whether it was Odin or uh, whoever, but they all sort of uh, reported up to Oberon and Titania. Yeah. which is fine, but if Oberon and Titania are both white, then suddenly we're saying, well, yeah, but Western myth overrules all the others. I didn't want that. Yeah. So um, I, I guess I was okay with saying Shakespeare overrules everything <laughs> else. But, uh, <laughs> uh, that shows my own bias, but um, we very consciously chose not to make them Caucasian. Right. Um, and thus every other mythology other than Oberon and Titania uh, all is on equal footing. Yes. Anansi isn't somehow less important than the Banshee, or right. Raven is not any less or more important than Puck, uh, or, or any of those things, because we wanted all of them to have equal footing um, in there. And we also just, let's face it, got an amazing story fodder by taking this world tour, by going to Egypt, by going to yes. Easter Island, etc. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. I mean, you know, uh, that was, again, I I can't speak highly enough of that whole experience for those characters, for me watching it, like, could not wait for them to get to the next place. But once again, even though they were traveling around or introduced to new characters essentially every episode, you still held on to that continuity. You know, if something happened, that changed the course of things. Right. And, I, I, you know, it just goes to show you just how incredibly thought out and how deep the thought was on this show. And I know you... Well, I mean, we had a tremendous staff on this. I mean, for starters, my partner, my producing partner on the show, Frank Parr, um, was very involved in the story. He wasn't a writer himself, but he was very involved in the story. Mm -hmm. And we had Michael Reeves, who had been our story editor and head writer for season one. And then in season two, we expanded. We had amazing people, Bryn Chandler Reeves, Terry Bates, uh, the late great Gary Sperling, um, were our, and Michael were our four story editors. We had terrific writers working under them, including and especially Lydia Morano. Um, and we would have monthly meetings where we would break stories, and and that group of people would be there and talking through all this stuff. And you know, part of my job specifically was to make sure that that four story editing teams working. I've got to make sure that all this stuff is consistent that the episodes mm-hmm. all stand on their own feet so that, you know, if the first episode you're ever seeing of Gargoyles <laughs> is the one where they go to Paris, it's all there in the episode, what you need to know. Right. Um, but so that it hooks you and you go, this show's interesting. I want to see another one. And then you see another one. And you're like, hmm, I really like this. Let me go back and see the ones I miss right. um, on VHS. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, and uh, let me keep watching obviously you got a lot more out of the show if you watched it from the beginning mm-hmm. and you watched them in order sure. but you still wanted to be able to bring in new viewers by allowing them to watch at any time I made one big uh, mistake I think the one um, from a production standpoint mistake that I truly regret is doing all those previously on Gargoyles <laughs> segments <laughs> because I, was, I think it created you did that well it's fine if you are one of those people who are going to absolutely watch every single episode yes. right. <laughs> then it, what it, 
then what it acts as is a little bit of a teaser. You get a kind of, you get hints of what's going to yeah. be important and show up again, and it's kind of fun. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But if you're new... <laughs> you feel like you missed it. You feel like you're in the You feel like you missed stuff. Mm-hmm. When, in fact, everything you needed to know in the episode was in the episode. Right. You didn't need that previously. That's and the main good. reason we did that was not to do these sort of, here's what you need to know... That wasn't at all why we did it. It was an editorial cheat. Mm. You know, we were getting animation back from overseas, and not every frame of footage is good, mm. you know. So we, by doing those 30-second previously segments, we could cut 30 seconds of bad animation <laughs> from the show. You know, and I'm not talking about entire scenes, obviously. I'm talking about, you know, a few frames here, a few frames there, you know, this kind of thing, it allowed us to tighten up the pacing huh. and it allowed us to get rid of really ugly frames of animation, you know, and and bad posing or stuff like that. Yeah. Just by giving us 30 seconds of editorial flexibility. But the downside was is that people sometimes would tune in, they'd see that previously thing in there, and they couldn't make heads or tails of the previously thing. Right. The episode <laughs> itself would have been fine, but the previously thing threw them off. Yeah. I actually think it discouraged new viewers. Hmm. And the one thing I would have, you know, if one was, and I'm glad I don't go back and (laughs) if there was one thing I would redo differently, I would say, you know, we're not doing these previously on. That's uh, amazing. That just blew my mind. For years, I was convinced that you guys had set that up just so in case you missed the pre, like the last episode, you knew all the, like you knew what was going on a little bit. you knew the players were and where you were, you know. That's, that's amazing. Yeah. Or, (laughs) Yeah, for yeah, it's funny though they 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 have been playing they they've done that previously thing. I cite the Avatar: The Last Airbender show, uh, that was pretty much the show. Like after after like the first two episodes, every episode started with a previously, and maybe they maybe you they. Know, I don't. I can't. You know, I didn't work on that show, so I don't know no, why right. they no, did no, it. No, uh, maybe it was for the exact same reason. I was going to say maybe they ate off their idea. They're like, man, a couple of but, these. Or frames. maybe it, it was from this notion that they thought, since there was an element of serialization to the show, that they yeah. thought it might be necessary. Exactly. Mm. And I don't, you know, but my experience is because I watched Avatar and loved it. Right. They didn't need them. Yeah. Those no, episodes. No, like, Stood alone, um, and everything you needed to get re-upped on, you got re-upped on in the episode itself. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And um, as my sense of things, this isn't like I've done scientific studies, but <laughs> I feel very strongly about it, is that those, it's a mistake to do that. It's right. great. In an era of binge-watching, yeah, when you plan on watching entire seasons, it's great. Yes. Um, But in an era of, uh, in the era when we made this stuff, Mm -hmm. um, and particularly for a kid audience, it's a big mistake. That's, I mean, it's not tragic. I don't think it's true. But but I do think our viewership suffered from it a bit. It's funny when you think about, like, the state of, you know how how media is absorbed today. Cartoons that cartoons and TV shows that and how they're absorbed today versus back then. Um, if you back then, if you missed an episode, that was it. Unless you found the tape, or unless someone, unless you taped it yourself. Like so, you. I, I'm sure you had that mentality when you were infusing character and story into the episodes you're writing, and so as such like the previously thing might help but at the same time you know you you, sh- you need you need to be able to stick everything that is what the show is in there just just because you might miss that episode <laughs> seemingly forever like you may never catch that again but that of course yeah is i mean lost that's true but mind. i also think that um sometimes what happens is that uh is that it's like well, you didn't explain this element of the show. I'm like, yeah, because that's not an issue in this episode. Right, exactly. Right, right. We're not doing so that. Like, who cares I don't even want to bring it up. You know, in yeah. other words, if I don't bring that aspect up, no one who's new 
is going to miss it because right. they don't know about mm. it to miss it. Yeah. And the fact is, is that as long as the episode is strong, even people who have seen every single one, they're not going to be upset that we didn't deal with this one aspect of the show in right. every single episode. Right. No, it's you know, true. Once so, they become fans, um, they'll look for it. <laughs> yeah. 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 You know, it, it, it doesn't... It, it's amazing how, going back to my theme, less is more. You know, oh, yes. you don't need everything in the kitchen sink in every episode. Mm -hmm. You don't need to over-explain stuff. In fact, it can cause more problems than it'll help. Yeah. Because then people get bogged down and caught up. Well, wait, what was that? I, I don't understand. Where'd that come? And you're sitting there going, yeah, don't worry about it because it doesn't matter. In this <laughs> it's true. And, and then they're like, well, if it didn't matter, why'd you bring it up? And I'm like, oh, yeah, it's never even brought it up. You know, um, and it's that kind of thing. Right. You know, circling back kind of to when you were talking about um, the just the level of work that went into this show and, you know, talking about their the world tour and all that and, and how every country that was visited, um, if they ran into characters from there, they were heavily influenced by the lore that was there. Um, I was just wondering, and I, know, I, I didn't mention this earlier, it, it, you know, it kind of naturally came to me, so if it's okay, I thought I might ask if where the designs and the influence for the main cast of characters, the actual gargoyles themselves, came from? Because when they go to South America, it's very influenced by South American mythology. When they go to Japan, you, you see the, the Japanese like influence there. Um, even when they go to England, um, you see it there as well. And yeah. I was just wondering, did you pull specifically from Scottish lore or, or to make these characters, or was it no we amalgam? really didn't not originally i mean one of the things that happened to us and this is going to sound like a tangent but it's not <laughs> uh trust me um is uh when we did the pilot for example um we had vikings attacking the scottish castle right, right. now the main reason for that is vikings are cool right. <laughs> yes they are <laughs> no in other words you know it's the, it's the dark ages vikings that'd be cool yeah then after the fact, we were doing a bit of research, and we're like, actually, in the late 10th century, Vikings were attacking the west coast of Scotland. <laughs> we got it right by accident. Right. That's oh, okay. amazing. And having gotten it right by accident, um, I made a decision that we were going to do everything in our power to get it right on purpose from that point on. That's really cool. But what, and the reason that's not totally a tangent is that when we started the show and created the original designs for the main gargoyle characters, which is Goliath and Demona, mm -hmm. uh, Brooklyn and Lexington, Broadway, Bronx, Hudson, um, that's the Wyvern clan. What we were really inspired by were just gargoyles in general. Now, I had been fascinated with gargoyles at least since high school. Um, there was a time in my life long before this, the show was even, you know, a twinkle in my eye, so to speak, mm -hmm. um, when I collected postcards of gargoyles. Or there was a time I was traveling with some friends in Europe, and we went to Notre Dame Cathedral, and I would have my, you know, I'd take photographs. I'd have my friends stand next to a gargoyle and mimic the gargoyle's pose, <laughs> you know. Um, and so all these... Uh, Initial designs weren't influenced by any specific gargoyle of this culture or that culture. In fact, if anything, mm -hmm. I had to pick one source. It would probably be France, not Scotland. Okay. Um, because that's where Notre Dame Cathedral and all, that's where, you know, if you're looking through books of gargoyles, that's yes. where you find right. the most evocative one. Mm -hmm. And I uh, studied for a semester in Oxford, oh. England. And Oxford is a great gargoyles town. I got tons of poetry. You know, they have comedic gargoyles. They have all sorts of gargoyles <laughs> there. The gargoyles based on great professors, you know, that, that taught there and that kind of thing. And the great professor's dog. There's a gargoyle based on the dog that sat mm -hmm. in, in okay. front of his desk for, for 15 years, you know, that kind of thing. It's a great gargoyle town. But the gargoyles, <laughs> they're a little more conservative, uh, also okay. very heraldic. Um, so those influenced the English gargoyles that we introduced in the London episode later in yes. the series. But I would say the single probably biggest influence um, of the original cast 
was probably French gargoyles. Interesting. That makes but it, it wasn't even limited to that because it wasn't even that well thought out. It wasn't like we were sitting there going, let's use French gargoyles as opposed to the, it, nothing like that. It was just like, let's get books on gargoyles, picture right. books, look at those. <laughs> that looks cool. Oh, look at the beak on that one. Oh, look at how the wings attach. You know, it was that kind of thing about grotesques and gargoyles. Yeah. Where it was just like we would steal from whatever. Mm-hmm. I just think in hindsight, if you looked at those books that we were using as reference and as inspiration, um, most of the ones were probably from France. Um, not all, but most. Right. And then we also had a bunch of different artists working on it initially. Mm-hmm. Um, we had four different development artists over time. Um, Greg Guler. Basically, who became our lead character designer in season two, cool. but was also there developing. And, and I would say that Goliath, uh, Elisa, Demona, Angela were fundamentally create Xanatos. Uh, no, not Xanatos, I take that back. But uh, <laughs> the other ones I mentioned were fundamentally visually created by Greg. Oh. Um, then we have Bob Klein, who who created Xanatos. Um, we had uh, um, Dave Schwartz, who created Brooklyn, Lexington, and Broadway. We had uh, Paul Felix, who created Hudson and Bronx. Um, so we had all these different artists, all these different sensibilities. And then we had an uh, artist in Japan who worked with Frank Parr to then create sort of a consistent uh, vision, Mr. Takeuchi, worked with Frank Parr in Japan just as season one went into pre-production to then take all the disparate artistic styles from all these different people and create a consistent uniform style for season one. And then Greg Gula came back and built on that for all the characters we introduced in season two. That's spectacular. Like that's That's so amazing to have... Not only that, the experience of having several artists work on this, but then to be able to take somebody and to have them like really like, like make, unify them. Yeah, in some way. that's that's great. That's so spectacular because it really does allow for so much more creativity to happen yeah. um, instead of just relying on well, one yeah, person to make a, it all. <laughs> we had other uh, designers on season two. Also, Mike Bosberg created characters and and everything, but we had to still make them all feel like they look part of the same world. Right, right. right. Um, I feel like I'd be doing an injustice if we didn't get the opportunity to talk about the fact that there's so much of the show connected to Shakespeare. Um, and I'd like, I'd love to know where this came from. And, you know, just, you know, again, we, t- we talked about the, the world myth, um, but then you have Shakespeare, um, which... <laughs> He is a writer himself, Mm -hmm. um, and you incorporated many of the stories. Um, And then also went beyond that and and, and include this Arthurian lore, which deals directly with all of this. Um, So was that from you? Was that, did it just kind of Well, I think initially it it was from me. I mean, um, it really all starts with Macbeth. Mm -hmm. Um, (laughs) So we were working on a story, Frank Parr, Michael Reeves and I were working on Star. I can literally remember sitting in a restaurant called the Eclectic Cafe, which was just across the street from the building where we all worked, um, and talking about you know the next episode and who the villain was going to be because we'd done a lot with Demona and Macbeth and we introduced the pack, but we wanted to create a new villain, mm-hmm. and um, I wanted to create a guy who was a gargoyle hunter specifically. Mm-hmm. Um, and this was before we had the concept of the hunters, right. um, mm-hmm. which came later. Mm-hmm. But I was like, you know, think of this guy. I said, I don't want him to have superpowers. But think <laughs> of this guy like Batman. <laughs> you know, in other words, really built, you know, really... Uh, um, Resourceful or... You know, uh, physically strong and all this sort of stuff, but not super strong, human level. And then a lot of money and a lot of tech that helps compensate for the fact that he's fighting these gargoyles. Right. And then as we discussed it, I'm like, and what would be great if there was something to really connect him in some way to the heroes, I said, because, you know, it's villains are always better when they're in some way a reflection on the hero. Yes. Right. 
So, you know, the Joker is chaos to Batman's order. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, Two-Face takes Batman and Bruce Wayne's duality and brings it to life. You know, that kind of idea. And that was a rule that we tried really hard to respect on Gargoyles. Mm -hmm. The villains always had to have some thing that gave them that made them in one way or another a dark reflection of our heroes. Right. Usually Goliath, not always, but <laughs> usually Goliath. Um, and uh, so we're like, well, what if this was a guy from Scotland, you know, some immortal Scottish king? Mm-hmm. I'm like, well, if we're doing immortal Scottish king, <laughs> the most immortal Scottish king out there is Macbeth. Exactly. <laughs> um, he hasn't lived forever <laughs> in a literal sense, but in the sense that if you had to name one Scottish king, you said the man to there, name, yeah. you know, who else would you name? You yeah. know, um, and you know, someone out there is going to say David the Second. You know, I'm not <laughs> no one remembers David the Second. You know, right. um, uh, and sure, you know, there's Robert Bruce. There are a couple others, I suppose, right. but no yeah. one's more famous than Macbeth. So we no. started with Macbeth. We're like, well, what if this is? Because Macbeth has an actual connection to Demona. Yeah. And we went from there. But what Macbeth, by bringing Macbeth, that just sort of opened these floodgates. Then what started to happen is my personal, <coughs> excuse me, my personal obsession with Shakespeare, and I am a Shakespeare fanboy, <laughs> you know, in much the same way that people are Batman fanboys or right. something like that. I mean, not that I don't love Batman too, but I... <laughs> you know, uh, particularly in those days before I had kids, was constantly, you know, chasing Shakespeare all around Southern California. Mm. I'd go as far as San Diego, I'd go to Utah, I'd go wherever to go see Shakespeare plays. Wow, I loved awesome. it. Um, so one thing that started happening is that the writers began to pander <laughs> to my love of Shakespeare. Okay. <laughs> so I didn't come up with every Shakespeare thing that came in there, but I think part of it was that the writers would go, well, we do this sort of Shakespearean, Greg will let it go through. Because <laughs> gotcha. What was interesting is that on the one hand, I was perfectly aware that that's what they were doing. <laughs> and on the other hand, I was really okay with that. Yeah, um, <laughs> so we wound up, you know, even when we introduced Coldstone and we did, you know, uh, and Cold Fire and Cold Steel mm-hmm. before they had those names, you know, we introduced them in basically by doing the Othello story. Mm-hmm. Uh, and um, and then we brought in Puck and Oberon and the Weird Sisters, yep. Tanya. Mm-hmm. Um, later, particularly in the comics, I brought in uh, Falstaff and right. Ardoff mm-hmm. and um, Gall and uh, Crickly and all these characters from Shakespeare. Because it's so rich, why wouldn't I? Yeah, yeah. absolutely. And and much like um, I was inspired by your like uh, infusion of world mythology, infusing Shakespearean stories into there, I have no doubt has you know opened up so many people to that if they've never experienced it, especially as, as a child. Like you know, you're you're a young child, you're watching this, and then you go to school and you're reading about Macbeth. You're like, oh, okay, this is a different Macbeth, but you know, I'm kind of you know, I know I'm this character, and I'm, I'm interested in this. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, one of the truly most gratifying things in my whole career, and it happens easily once or twice a year, even now, 21 years later, mm-hmm. you know, is uh, someone will come up to me and say, I read Midsummer Night's Dream because of Gargoyles, exactly. or I read Macbeth <laughs> because of Gargoyles, or I love Shakespeare because Gargoyles introduced yeah. me to it. And, and, you know, there's literally nothing is more gratifying to me than that, you know. Yeah. So. That's amazing. Um, That's I mean, like that to have that kind of effect, and yeah. and like I said, like you, the the just the amount of um, spectacular you know history and lore that's infused into this, um, and even just the you know fun references, you know, yeah. like it, there's just these little things that when you learn more about them, you're like, oh man, I knew about that from gargoyles or like i was first introduced to that through this show because there's just so much to it well i think it also yeah helps. i mean one of my favorite moments is in uh is there's a moment in an episode called future chance where david xanatos character xanatos uh paraphrases hamlet yeah 
and then paraphrases my Python two seconds later. <laughs> and I'm like, that's, you know, that's our show. You know, that is um, the idea. Because, yeah, obviously there are a lot of Shakespeare references and mythological references, but mm-hmm. there's all sorts of other, you know, we've got a character named Maggie the Cat. We've got another character called Pal Joey, you know, yeah. uh, American 20th century American theater references. Oh, yeah, the fact uh, that Movie you references. Had... And not, you know, we weren't shy about borrowing from all sorts of different right. sources. Right. So. The, the fact that you had um, Elisa's cat be Cagney, <laughs> you know, like... It yeah, that like... was Michael Reed's idea. <laughs> and after he named the cat Cagney, I'm like, so is this named for James Cagney or for Cagney and Lacey? <laughs> and uh, he was, like, almost insulted. He's like, it's for James Cagney. I'm like, okay. Uh, <laughs> I assume it was Cagney and Lacey. Um, well, to and be I, fair, I, mean, I, 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 I thought it was the audience for themselves. <laughs> <laughs> um, one other thing that, that definitely has a strong um, tie to this show, um, in as much as voice talent goes, is Star Trek. You, in the, in the first two seasons, have a representative from each of the four... Main um, crew members. Well, no, no, the four <laughs> shows that had come out to That's that right. point. You know, you have Nichelle Nichols, um, Jonathan Frakes, um, you know, uh, Avery Brooks was in it. Yep. Um, and Kate Mulgrew. How did that begin? Like, how did it just, was it just, you know, you... Did, it was it began it, you with know? Marina Kiritis and Jonathan Frakes. Um, really? And it begins with um, our original auditions for the lead roles of the show, mm-hmm. uh, wherein, uh, and that's um, Goliath and Elisa, Brooklyn Lex and Broadway, mm-hmm. Hudson Bronx, uh, Zana Johnson, and Demora. Yes. And we put together what we called audition sides, which is a sort of single page monologue um, that will, would allow various actors to audition. And literally the first person to walk through the door, because it wasn't like we were doing all the Demonas on one day and all the um, Goliaths on one day. It was just, you know, we had agents and actors in those days. And nowadays, for most first-round auditions, those actors, nine times out of ten, are either recording them at home or recording them at their agent yeah. okay. uh, booth. But in those days, they came in mm-hmm. um, and read for us. And the very first person through the door reading was Marina Sirtis, who read for Elisa Mazza. Oh. It's hard to pick. But at the time, she read for Elisa Mazza, and she wasn't quite right for it. Mm-hmm. In particular, it wasn't actually named Elisa Mazza then. It was Elisa Chavez. So oh. I was looking typically for a Hispanic actress yes. um, to play the role, so that wasn't quite right. But there sure was something great about her voice. Yeah. And I thought she'd be great for Demona, yeah. um, or at least I'd like to hear her read for Demona. But the problem was is we didn't quite have the Demona side ready yet. Oh. So as she loves to remind me, uh, um, we had to make her come back. Uh, she became the first person to read for Demona. She was amazing. We obviously you know, had to have other people read for mm-hmm. it, but we pretty much knew right. that she was it. Um, Likewise, during that audition process, uh, Jonathan Frakes came in. He read for both Goliath and Xanatos. Oh, cool. Um, and he was fantastic for Xanatos. So yeah. we wound up with these two Star Trek actors um, just because they had won right. you know, their own talent. It wasn't like we were going for Star Trek actors. No. Right. Um, you know, uh, I hadn't pre-cast anybody in, even mentally in my head except Hudson. Um, really? Yeah, and so I didn't have any preconceptions going into it. In fact, in terms of the gargoyles, we didn't even know what gargoyles should sound like. (laughs) Um, And but here we were having cast our our uh, eight leads um, or nine, I guess, uh, if you count blogs. Having cast those leads, we. um, had two Star Trek actors yep. in our booth almost every week. <laughs> so after that, we never auditioned again for any role except Angela in season two. Ah. Really? After that, there, there's time in our business to audition week in, week out, to hold auditions for guest characters and 
even recurring characters. There's just not, not enough hours in the day. Right. So the process would be, we'd be in there recording a script with our voice director, who's also our casting director, a phenomenally talented guy named Jamie Thomason, who I worked on, worked with on many shows, starting with Gargoyles. And Jamie would be in there with me and Frank and say, okay, what are we going to need for next week? And I, just as an example, be like, well, we need Goliath's brother, Cold <laughs> Stone. And I'm like, but, you know, Keith David has these big chops, deep voice, big right. chops. We need someone who can hold his own with Keith David. Right. Who could we get that has these big, deep chops like Keith? And then we'd be looking through the glass, because we're literally on a break, <laughs> you know, during a recording of the prior episode. Mm -hmm. I'm looking through the booth, and, and I'm like, and Marina and Jonathan are sitting there, and I'm like, well, what about Michael Porn? Right. <laughs> and it wasn't like some plan. Right. It was just sort of like, they were like living reminders that there was this great ensemble of actors. Right. And then, you know, it, it helped that, you know, a, a lot of them had never done uh, animation acting before, voice mm -hmm. acting before. Some of them had done a little bit, but most of them hadn't done any. Okay. Um, but, you know, Jonathan, you know, LeVar Burton would would uh, um, go up to Jonathan or, and or Marina and go, so I got asked to play a spider on <laughs> your Gargoyles show. And I don't, And they're like, oh, you should totally do it. Because right. it's great, you know. You know, or Brent Spiner saying, yeah, you know, I uh, got asked, or, or Michael Dorn or any of those guys going, I got asked to play it. And they're like, you should do it. You don't have to memorize the line. You go to Dorn and the Spiner and go, no makeup, right. our Burton. You don't have to wear any fake contact lenses or visors. Mm -hmm. You know, you can come in your pajamas if you want to, yeah. and and it's fun. And you know, it's not you don't make a fortune doing animation right. uh, unless you're doing a ton of it. Yeah. Um, even then, probably not a fortune. But the point is, is that it's, it's a nice amount of money for for three at most four hours work. Right. No makeup, no costumes, and not even any memorization. Right. Um, and so it's a pretty sweet gig. And so they would be like, okay, we'll do it. And they all had fun. Yeah. Um, you know, I became very close. I'm, I'm still good friends with Maria and Jonathan and Brent. Uh, I know Michael and LeVar just a little bit. Okay. Um, uh, and then, you know, at some point, after we cast Michelle Nichols to play Elisa's mother, oh, Diane hmm. Mazza, yeah. um, I was like, well, what if we got someone from every uh, <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah. And the thing to keep in mind is we recognize the publicity value of having Star Trek actors. Mm -hmm. um, and we were great with that. <laughs> you know? yeah. um, now, we never, ever would have cast someone who was wrong for a role just for the sake of publicity Same. or yeah. for the sake of, well, wouldn't it be cool if we got somebody, anybody right. from Voyager or something like that? We would never do that. But when you got the opportunity to get Kate Mulgrew to play Titania, yeah. why wouldn't you do that? Yes. <laughs> and if on top of that, that gives you the publicity value of getting someone from Voyager, which means we've now got someone from every Star Trek show, yes. uh, yeah. why wouldn't you do that? Absolutely. You know? I mean, and overall, the show and its casting oh, it's amazing. is spectacular. It's a veritable who's who of, I mean, of, of, and, of voice acting. And I, I, the reason I reacted the way you did talking about how you knew in your head that you knew he wanted to play Hudson is I like it's I couldn't imagine anyone else but Ed Asner yeah. playing that role. I adore yeah. Ed Asner's voice and his voice work. Mm -hmm. Um so yeah, I I, I you know like the one I, the, the interesting thing about Ed is that um I absolutely had Ed in mind for Hudson mm -hmm. on the one hand. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, I never thought we could get him. Mm -hmm. He was such a big star. It never occurred to me that we could get him. And But what I had done is, in addition, you write that one-page monologue that I mentioned, mm -hmm. the audition side. But what I also did is write a single page that describes the character for the actor to read. So they're not reading the monologue cold. They can read the page that describes the character to inform yeah, the monologue they're about to read. Okay. So the very last line of the Hudson description page said, Hudson hates spunk. 
Now, if you know your classic 1970s television, mm-hmm. yes. you know that in the very first episode of the Mary Tyler Moore <laughs> Show, in which Ed Asner plays Lou Grant, yep. there's this literally one of the truly classic scenes of, from any sitcom ever mm-hmm. is a scene where Mary's got her job interview. Mary Richards has her job interview yep. with Lou Grant. And she is answering his questions and she's perky and chipper and all this stuff. And Lou turns to her and says, you know what, kid, you've got spunk. And Mary gets all happy and he goes, I hate spunk. <laughs> and it's one of the greatest lines ever. Yes. Um, so we put that in the description. And then lo and behold, I had said to Jamie and Thomas and our voice director that, you know, he saw that line, he knew what it meant, so he knew I was looking for an Ed Asner type, and he got Ed Asner to come in and audition for us. Oh, my gosh. And so Ed told me later, he read that description and saw the last line, Hudson Hates Spunk, and he's going, and he was thinking, all right, cool, you know, I've got this one. You know? <laughs> uh, then he had the opposite reaction, which is that, man, if I don't get this one, I'm going to be pissed. Um, <laughs> and... Uh, you know, he read and he was incredible. And then just because life is never quite that easy, we're like, that was so great. Can you do it with the Scottish accent? <laughs> and the truth was, Scottish was not an accent that was really in his repertoire. You know, uh, you know, like uh, me, uh, Ed is an Ashkenazi Jew. So <laughs> Eastern Europe, sure. Russian, sure. You know, um, Scottish? No one had ever asked Ed Asner to be Scottish. Um, but, you know, he found it, summoned it up, did it did it Scottish, and did the whole, uh, you know, three years uh, yeah. worth of Scottish and was fantastic. Yeah. And, again, no one else could have played Hudson. No, yeah. oh, I'm, no you're absolutely 100% right. Um, I, you know, I just the, – the cast list that you guys have is spectacular. Yeah. I mean, Tim Curry – um, Back to the Future fans will recognize Elisa's partner, Matt Bluestone, as Thomas F. Wilson, mm. Biff himself. Yep. Um, even Clancy Brown. Yeah, Clancy Brown, certainly. I mean, you, you know, even, of course, the Disney favorite of Jim Cummings was had to be involved at some point. Oh, yeah. Um, I mean, we had Jim Cummings, we had Jeff Bennett, we had Tom Ancash, we had Bill Fogerbachy, we had John Reese davies we had yeah. David Warner, we had Roger Reese, we had three or four of the most significant hamlets of all time in our show. Yeah, I mean, Um, how many, honestly, how many shows in general can say that? How many animated shows have this sort of... This robust cast. Yeah, exactly. It's true. Um, you know... I think that's it. Yeah, (laughs) I'm like, just... Just, just in awe of everything that we have talked about today. I mean, the fact is, you know, you created not only a spectacular show, but a significant um, piece of, I think, many people's childhood. Easily. You know, I mean, when I think back on the 90s, you know, and anyone talks about cartoons, this is my go-to. This was yep. the thing I look forward to most coming home from school. Oh, easily. Um, and it's something that I've never forgotten to the point where... Even if I haven't seen the episodes or the show in years, I remember these significant moments, and I think it's just because of the incredible world you like you created, the the you know fantastic and uh, you know in depth storylines and these characters that you know grew over time. I mean, it introduced me to this whole new level of animated show that every other show had to live up to. Yeah. Um, and I think well, I, thank you. I no <laughs> no thank you like seriously thank you for going on the limb and as I learned today taking another show that I watched Gummy Bears yeah. uh, and spinning something spinning else. something like spectacular out of it I mean truly spectacular out of it um, I I just I'm just gushing at this yeah. point <laughs> and and it would it would usher in and uh, I think it I think it did an excellent job of being one of the you know one of those influential series that informed where animated series were going to go or or at least he- held up or upheld the noble tradition of those kinds of shows um and of course you'd be involved in with 
with with so many other incredible shows that people that are watching the show, you know, as this is recorded and so forth, will definitely want to talk about. And maybe we could do that again sometime in the future if you're up for it. But uh, but for sure. now, I just wanna just wanna say thank you for being here, offering your insight, sharing your stories, and and just being a part of this cultural touchstone for so many of us. Well, thanks. I appreciate it. Absolutely. And before we go, and before we wrap up, um, if you like uh, this amazing show, if you are in any way excited by uh, the name Greg we- uh, Weisman and what it means for you know so many uh, shows and so many different... It's uh, Weisman. Weisman, yeah. sorry. Weisman. <laughs> yeah. I gently corrected yeah, she did correct next... me. I was, like, I was like, yes, I'll say it in the next go-around. But, um, <laughs> but definitely uh, check out these incredible uh novels that he's worked on uh, greg you want to you want to take it again give us give us another spiel sure uh it, reign of the ghosts r-a-i-n of the ghosts plural um is the first book um it's about a young girl rain to seek who lives on a chain of caribbean islands called the ghost keys and uh she finds out that she has uh a destiny a mystery uh, a mission. Um, the second book in the series uh, is Spirits of Ash and Foam. Both of those are available on Amazon or at any bookstore. If you, you know, literally on the shelf the day that you happen to walk in, you can go to the desk and order them at nice. any mm-hmm. bookstore. Um, and then coming by the end of the year is the full cast unabridged uh, Rain of the Ghost audio play, which will be available on audible.com. Yep. And you can find out more about that at reignoftheghosts.com. Um, I'm also doing Star Wars Canaan, mm-hmm. comic book for Marvel, and premiering next month, the star brand, the Night Mask, uh, superhero comic yes. for Marvel. Um, I can be reached on Twitter at Greg underscore Weissman, W-E-I-S-M-A-N. Mm-hmm. I'm on Facebook. I don't understand Facebook. It's beyond <laughs> me, but you can right. follow or friend me on Facebook. I try my best. I go on Facebook. Uh, uh, Twitter, I get. Twitter, I'm on every night, and I get it. Yeah. Facebook is, is so confusing. I <laughs> do not understand it, but I try my best. I try at least for five or ten minutes a night to go on Facebook, so you can friend or follow me on Facebook. I have, like, two pages. One's, like, a fan page and one's a personal page and I honestly swear to God I don't know which is which <laughs> um, and uh, and then I have had a website for uh, 16, 17 years now called uh, askgregweissman.com yep. where I answer questions uh, it started mostly about gargoyles and nowadays most of the questions seem to be more young justice oriented but yep. uh I've been answering questions there for 20 years, and all the answers are archived, and the archive is searchable. Yeah. So um, the odds are, if you've got a question about Gargoyles or Young Justice or Spectacular Spider-Man or Witch or any of the shows I've done or animation, the business in general, Mm -hmm. the odds are I've already answered the question, (laughs) and you can go to the archive and find the answer there. And if you just happen to come up with some question that you can't find the answer for in the archive, you can post that question, and I will get to it eventually. I'll admit, I'm not proud of this, but I'm about a year behind answering questions because <laughs> I get so many. Yeah. Uh, but I do get to them all eventually. Yeah. Uh, so people can go to askgregweissman.com. If you've got a quick question, Twitter's probably your best bet. Yeah. Mm-hmm. If it's something I can answer, you know, in less than 140 characters, <laughs> that's great. But, you know, the people who, who tweet me questions that, in essence, require an essay to answer, you're better off just going to ask Craig. Right. <laughs> uh, because I, uh, there's no way for me to answer that. I don't offer spoilers even for shows that are no longer on the air because I always hope to come back. Right. Mm-hmm. Uh, early on in Gargoyles, I gave a lot of spoilers out after the show was over. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then, you know... A decade or so later, I had the opportunity to write Gargoyles comic books, yes, yes. Um, which we did uh, 18 issues of, three trade paperbacks, and I very much regretted <laughs> revealed so much stuff. Um, so I don't do that anymore. So if you're just, you know, tweeting or asking a question that's basically a spoiler, I'm just not going to answer it. Right. But Fair enough. otherwise, you know, 
Anything about process, I'm happy to answer. Anything about how we went about what we did, that's fine. Yeah. Um, any of that stuff, I'm, I'm more than happy to talk about. Gotcha. That That's amazing, and it's a spectacular resource. Oh, yeah. Um, because I know there are people who would love to pick your brain more thoroughly than we have done. Yep. On again, like like you said, like on the process, you yeah. know, like to have a creator who's willing to talk about the process, I think is 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 just amazing. Yeah, like, absolutely amazing. It's a rare quality. But thank you, Greg, for chatting with us. Yes. And uh, this was another episode of Elseworlds Exchange. Of course, go in the description box below this video to uh, go check out uh, Reign of the Ghosts and everything associated with it. It's uh, I can't wait to check it out myself, actually. No, oh, I really <laughs> am truly looking forward to it. Like, I'm giddily excited. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, we'll see you guys next time. Thanks so much for watching.